Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Radio Network. I'm your host, Mike Goodpasser. Right now, I want to welcome in my co-host, Jeremiah Pricer. How you doing, Jeremiah? I'm doing very well, Mike. Happy to be on. Always happy to be on. Let's talk some boxing, Mike. Well, most definitely. We had some interesting fights, somewhat entertaining. Uh, we'll start off with Polly Malinaji against Sam Eggington. Um, Eggington knocked him out in the eighth round with a body shot. Malinaji retired afterwards. What was your take on the fight? Yeah, well, you know, it was kind of as expected. I mean, I, I didn't know if Eggington was going to stop him, but I, I thought Malinaji might make it to the finish line. But just he looked a bit too big for Malinaji, in my opinion. He was a bit too physical. Uh, just looked the stronger the pair. Uh, used his distance pretty well early on. Um, you know, in Malinaji, he had his spots, you know, especially like the, uh, you know, the, what was it, a 20-punch combination? Yeah, he threw a 20-punch combination at the end of, like, maybe the fifth round, sixth round. Yeah, yeah you know, But, but that's Malinaji's problem. Like that. He hits a guy 20 times unanswered and doesn't even drop the guy. No, the guy just he barely flinches and then just moves on. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, he, like everybody, he wasn't too bothered by Malinaji. Um, but, you know, it was... I think a lot of us were hoping that, you know, because we, we enjoy Malinaji behind the, the broadcast table, and he's been able to do a lot largely with just a jab and footwork. I mean, you know, for a guy who could you know, barely crack an egg, um, you know, he's done quite well for himself. But, uh, you know, I was kind of rooting for him. I was pulling for him. I really like him uh, behind the broadcast table. But he'll have a, he'll have a long, fruitful career you know, on Showtime and, and other broadcasts. Well, and the, the interesting thing is he actually, after getting knocked out by the body shot, sat in and did the, or called the main event. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. He did a solid job, too. I mean, I actually like him. Um, he's, done a, he's done that a number of times where he's gone over to Britain and done some of the commentaries. And it's interesting, you know, you hear the, the British perspective and the perspective. And I, I think it adds a nice little, uh, uh, it, it adds some nice coloring to the, the broadcast team, but um, you know, Malinaji, like I said, he's going to be good behind the broadcast table. He's one of my he's one of my personal favorite. Um, as a fighter, he was never one of my personal favorites. He's one of the best announcers in the game. All right, um, and then we bring that up. It looks like that's what he's going to be doing from now on. Um, what's your take on Malinaji, Malinaji's career? I mean, I think he definitely had a good career. He be, he beat some solid fighters. Uh, I, I think the fight that I remember the most about him is because. I mean, he was a little dude who was going around running his mouth, and you always wait for that to see how tough they actually are. And I know Miguel Cotto pretty much dominated him, but I think the effort that he had against Cotto was when I first really took him seriously as a boxer. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, me being a Denver native, I mean, I, I watched a number of his fights coming up, like uh, the, the, the Cano fight. Um, you know, because Malinaji was pretty highly touted in the amateurs. I mean, he wasn't, you know, an Olympian-type fighter or not. But, um, again, me being a Denver native, I saw him dominate Donald Camarena on TV. And I knew, you know, Camarena was a friend guy. But, you know, I was like, you know, Malinaji is going to be a good fighter. But, yeah, the Kota fight, I think, is the most recognizable because he took such a beating in it and kept moving forward. And, I mean, I like some of his other efforts, too. I mean, people forget about the Love More Endo fight. I mean, Endo was never – he was never a top-notch fighter, but he was iron-chinned, and he was a guy who would always come and get it. And Malinaji was actually able to drop him. Good timing, you know. It wasn't as if Endo was wobbling around the ring or anything, but um, that fight was one that sticks out for me as well. Then the Ricky Hatton fight, of course, because Hatton was, you know, one of my favorites at the time. Also – I mean, you remember the Juan Diaz fight, uh, the yeah. post fight interview where he, you know, basically said, like we all know, boxing's full of shit sometimes. Yeah, and there you go with bad words on the air. But all right, so we hey, stopped I'm, your streak. I'm directly it, quoting him. <laughs> now I, I know you interviewed Dat Win, which everybody can hear this weekend on the GruelingProof.net. Did you use any bad words with Dat? I did avoid all the bad words again. Yeah, hey, so your streak I, stopped at four shows. All right. No, um, hey. <laughs> No, you can't blame me. I'm directly quoting Pauli Paul Malinaji here. That's what he said. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess it makes it all right then. Um, and then, of course, the fight he sat in to help call was David Hay against Tony Bellew. Um, Bellew ended up winning the fight by a TKO in the 11th round. The thing that stood out to me here 
was not the fact that Bell, you, I mean, the thing that really stood out to me was the fact that David Hay, with the injury he had, to be able to fight on five or six rounds, he's not a guy that I would expect to do that. No, and I, I think a lot of people felt that way. Hay was he he was given a lot of uh, crap after what do they call it tailgate or something when he complained about his toe, said he couldn't go yeah, on. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we were all just kind of putting our you know our hands on our faces at that point. Like, come on, come on, man, just just admit that you were beaten by a better guy. We don't need to go through with all this. But yeah, I mean, it looked pretty serious too. I mean, he was hobbling around the ring. He kept backing up against the ropes, and you know, because of his he couldn't plant his foot. Not only was he not generating any power, but he wasn't able to move his head effectively either. So, I mean, he was taking flush shots from Bellew time and time again. I mean, I don't want to – I don't want to exaggerate the amount of credit that I want to give Hay. I mean, it, it was a gutsy performance. But I don't think – Hay has never been considered – you know, he's never had a chin made of granite. You know, he's not a particularly particularly tough guy. Um you know, so I, I think Bellew's light hitting kind of helped him stay in there a bit. I think if he was against a, a bigger punch, he might have been out there sooner. But, yeah, it was a gutsy performance. And, and honestly, if David Hay didn't get the, energy, uh, the injury, I thought he would have won. Well, see, I think this. I think Bellew um, really went after in the first round or two after it happened. But it seemed to me like he backed off for a couple rounds also, which kept think- Hay in the fight. Because I think if Bellew would have stayed on him, no matter whether he's hitting him or hard or not, he would have hit him so many times they would have stopped the fight eventually anyways. Um, yeah. That brings me to Bellew, um, maybe your opinion on him. because I did have Bellew winning the fight like 3-2 to two going into the sixth round. He was doing better than what I thought he would. But, I mean, to me, he's a blown-up heavy or blown-up light heavyweight, cruiserweight. I mean, he's got some skill. But, but I'll give you this. I think that he would have a shot against Deontay Wilder because I don't think Wilder is technically nearly as good as Bellew. No, I, th- I think Bellew is technically better. But I'm not convinced that Bellew can deal with a guy that big. I mean, I mean, Wilder is not, you know, a big guy in terms of size. I mean, he's only 220 going in his last fight. But he has been a higher. He has been 230-plus. I'm just not, I'm not convinced Bellew can hang with any, not only top, heavyweight, but I'm not convinced that he can hang out, hang with the best cruiserweights. I mean, well, I, see, I I'm not convinced that, you know, Deontay Wilder can either. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I mean, Wilder has 38 fights, and we're still wondering. That's modern boxing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the best fighter he's fought is what, Stavern? Yeah, that was the only top 10 guy that he fought, and he didn't stop him. No, it went the distance. He didn't look great. So that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that if I'm Bellew, I'm trying to get Wilder because with Wilder swinging wild all the time, I mean, if Bellew can, you know, move around, use his jab a little bit, maybe he'd have a shot there because I think a guy like Anthony Joshua would kill him. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think he'd whoop him. But the thing with Wilder is he's just so long and so is his jab. I mean, Bellew, you can tell that he's got, you know, good technical ability. I mean, he, with David Hay, he was picking his spots. Unfortunately, I think he was waiting a bit too long. But I, I just don't think he can deal with a guy of, you know, any size at this point. I think he's best – I think he's probably better off either trying to get a big domestic showdown at heavyweight, kind of like he did against David Hay. I don't know if Tyson Fury would fight him, you know, in, in just a comeback fight. I, I, I don't know. I don't yeah, really who really knows him. what Fury's got left because who knows what the hell Fury's been doing for the last two years. Yeah, well, I don't know. I've seen some, some pictures of him lately. It looks like he's having a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're the heavyweight champion. You probably ought to, but you probably ought to stop after a few months and fight again. Yeah, especially when all these guys are, you know, especially when you see Anthony Joshua and Vladimir Klitschko taking each other on. You know, that might, that that's the type of stuff that motivates them. But so you think pretty much, I think Hayes pretty much done. I mean, if the injury, I don't know, did you ever hear exactly what the injury was? Was it an Achilles or? Yeah. Yeah, so his his Achilles separated from his, uh, I think it was his heel. And um, he had surgery not long after. And he was, uh, I saw, I don't know, it was a post on one of the social media sites. He said that he felt good afterwards. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a specialist. I can't really say, you know, where this, where he goes from here. I mean, if if they have a rematch and, Bel- and Hay can stay healthy, I, I think he wins. 
Yeah, but I would question this. At his age right now, with an injury like that, it's going to be hard to come back from it. Definitely. No, I agree. So I may even favor Bellew a little bit the second time just because of that. I mean, you don't know if it's going to stay together. And an injury like that can be nagging where you could take a year off, come back, and the first movement you make, it goes again. Yeah, you never know. I mean, but I think the age factor is most important here. I mean, Yeah, I mean, because when you get older, shit don't heal that yeah. well no more. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I thought he was a fantastic cruiserweight, but – He's looked a little bit slower in recent years, especially after that long layoff. And any any amount of time not spent in the gym, he's going to accumulate ring rust. And, and you know, again, the age is going to play a bigger factor. All right, that brings us to the main event of the weekend for the welterweight championship of the world. And if I hear one more person ever refer to this as just like Hearns and Leonard, I'm going to puke. But I actually, a lot of people ripped this fight. I thought it was a solid fight. I mean, you had Keith Thurman, who I thought, I thought Thurman looked good. I mean, he can't help that Danny Garcia doesn't want to come forward that much and mix it up with him. I had Thurman winning the fight 116 to 112. I think anybody that thinks it was anything else is a little bit crazy. But are you crazy or do you agree with me? No. Uh, man. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb, okay? I mean, Thurman clearly won the fight. I don't know a single person who actually paid attention to the fight, who scored it for Danny Garcia. Honestly, that, that judge, Kevin Morgan, uh, the only the guy who scored it for Danny Garcia, that guy should have his license taken away. I mean, I, I don't know why guys like that are doing fights. Um, you know, it was a close fight, but not a single, you know, person who watched the fight scored it in Danny Garcia's fight. I don't even think Angel scored it for Danny Garcia. Yeah, he said, I mean, that, he said that he couldn't see Thurman winning more than five rounds. Yeah, okay. Well, that's a bunch of But Angel's, you know, leaves, uh, he's got some problems sometimes. Yeah, yeah. We'll just leave it there. But, <laughs> yeah, but he's entertaining. But, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I thought it was a good fight. I mean, a lot of people complain about the way Thurman kind of ended it, but the way he started it was fantastic. I mean, he came right out and got in Danny Garcia's wheelhouse and beat him to the punch. He was quicker. He was just sharper. Um you know, he he was smart in his defense. Like I noticed when he would throw a right hand, he would duck under because it's well known that Danny Garcia likes to talk those hooks. So I thought Thurman's game plan was, was really, really good. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. He probably could have made more of a statement in the championship rounds, kind of like he did against Sean Porter. But when, again, back to your point, when Danny Garcia isn't pushing the fight, when he's tr- not trying to get in there by any means necessary, I can understand why Thurman's just like, okay, we just get the decision. Yeah, and but see, this is the difference between not all fighters today, but a lot of fighters today, and the Leonard and the Hearns. The Leonard and the Hearns, no matter how the other guys going, are going to try to finish the show. Right? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to close the fight out with a bang. I mean, yeah. you saw him do it a lot. I mean, Leonard Benitez, Leonard had to fight one. Leonard stopped him in the 15th round. Leonard could have just danced around and taken a decision. But once again, at the welterweight division, I don't think we'll ever see another Leonard Hearns. You know, people said that De La Hoya and Felix Trinidad was Leonard Hearns. No, it's not. <laughs> because I'm sorry, Sugar Ray Leonard and Tommy Hearns would have whooped all four of them's ass on the same night. Oh yeah, and yeah. I, mean, I mean that's just the way it is. They were all-time no. legends that happened to be together at the same time. It's just like heavyweights. You'll never see anything like Ali Frazier again. You know, you've had big no. heavyweight fights, but I mean, even you know, you get Tyson and Holyfield. That's not Ali and Frazier. I no, mean, I think people not. expect a little bit too much. And I mean, there's guys that come around once in a generation, and those are guys that come around probably once every hundred, hundred and fifty years. Yeah, well, I mean, boxing for boxing to get, you know, even, you know, get close to a golden era like that, I think they would have to reduce the divisions. And I think the, you know, the fundamental culture of boxing would have to change. I mean, you know, part, part of the reason we don't have these is because, you know, I think too many weight classes. I mean, again, if we didn't have one, I, I don't. I, I think the biggest problem overall 
is the lack of coaching with the United States, like the Olympic team, the amateurs. I just, I, those guys are not developed anymore. Because you know what? You, you hardly ever see Olympic boxing anymore. And when you do, it's like on MSNBC, they show all the fights on there. But, you know, they'll show it on the main network if you've got Americans that can win the gold medal. And there hasn't been a team like that since, what, 84, maybe 88. You had, you had Roy Jones, 92, you had Oscar De La Hoya. But since 90, 92, 96, there's not really been anything there. And the thing is, when you do the Olympics, it's just like 76, 84. 84, I taped all the Olympic fights. The thing that I remember about that is this. When Mark Breland was fighting, before every fight, they would do like a little, a short interview with him, and they'd do a five-minute on something that is happening in his life. So what you get is you know a little bit about what Pernell Whitaker and Meldrick Taylor have went through as people, and it gives you a hook to care when they come out and fight. I mean, you had all those guys that were on that great Olympic team. Um, I think it was November or December of 84, um, I think Taylor, Whitaker, Holyfield, Breland, Biggs, they all debuted on the same card. They called it a night of gold. They did it in prime time on ABC Sports. And you saw these guys' careers start. And this was really about the last fighters or last Olympic team where that happened for. But you have to build a story to get people invested in caring about these athletes. And you just don't see that anymore with boxing. No, no, I absolutely agree, and I, and I, I think it's, I think there's um, a multitude of other problems too. And uh, again, I, I wholeheartedly agree that, you know, we're not getting it down in the amateurs. I, I would also note that it, it, it seems like the era of sports has now become flash over legacy, right? I mean, Floyd yeah. Mayweather kind of, set, he, he helps set the tone for it, right? I mean, Mayweather fights, you know, particular guys on particular dates. And, you know, he's, he's doing it more for money than it is for legacy. It's not necessarily about fighting the very best in their primes. I mean, yeah, but, yeah, you know, but see, he, if you look at it, the last American fighter that was really huge was Mayweather. But if you remember, Mayweather, he had early fights, I think like his sixth, seventh fight, maybe his debut were on CBS Sports. And then he's fighting on AR on HBO from about fight eight or nine on. Right. So yeah, even if you hate him or you love him, you know about him. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, and he, you know, he also had that controversy surrounding him, too, because a lot of people thought that he should have won a gold medal in the Olympics as well. I mean, a lot of people thought that he lost um, in his final amateur fight. You know, they thought that he had actually won. It's just the, the economic system that I'm really talking about, though, you know. So, you know, when Mayweather, he, he, it just feels like it's more for money than it is for legacy. I mean, that's why we. Yeah, well, it. that's what all these athletes feel like now. Yeah, I mean, you see them all adopting this model. Danny Garcia's father, Angel Garcia, reiterated this point in an interview where he said, "You know, why would Danny fight a, a you know a guy like Keith Thurman, for instance, for three, four million dollars, when he can fight a guy like Robert Guerrero for you know one and a half, two and a half? Yeah, and not have to worry about getting hurt." Exactly. So, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of these guys have adopted that strategy, and it's hurt the sport of boxing. But Yeah, and, but, I mean, it's – you also – the other thing you got is you've got people seeing the effects of a boxing career or a football career, and I think that makes you want to maybe get in there, get your money, and get out a lot quicker, too, though. Right, and, and I, I, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with guys – you know, fighting less than they used to. I mean, guys like Robinson and you know, I mean, the, the guys in that era and, eras, and era before, um, yeah, and the, the guys with eras before, um, you know, they did it because they had to eat. Um, you yeah. know, these guys, they can fight one or two times a year and be perfectly fine. I, I'm okay with that. Personally, I prefer a, a strategy like Golovkin's and Kovalev's you know, guys who fight three, four times a year, you know, they fight one or two top ten guys, beat up a fringe guy, you know, kind of showcase their talent a bit. I wish there was more of that. Um, but, yeah, I certainly understand the risks and, and everything associated well, see, with and I think another thing that has hurt it is just the fact that football, baseball, basketball are so big and they pay so much money now that, you know, if you're in the inner city, maybe you're more likely to pick up a basketball than boxing gloves. 
Yeah, you know, it's just like the heavyweight division. I mean, hell, if this if the NFL paid the way it does today, and it was the way it was, hell, you might have had a guy like Lennox Lewis 25 years ago decide to decide to come to this country, go to college, and try to be a tight end. You never know. I mean, I've heard people talk about this time and time again. You know, the the next great American heavyweight champion is probably playing, you know, linebacker, defensive. Yeah, it's O.J. You know, Howard. Defensive. He's a tight end. He's 6'5", 250, runs a four five forty, and he's built like a Greek god. I mean, that that's the guy that, you know, at one point would have been a boxer. Exactly. I mean, and, and you, from a from an average fan's perspective, too, it's, you know, boxing just feels like a dangerous sport. If I can that kind of money or better money doing something easier, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I, even though I believe football is probably more dangerous because you go 16 straight weeks getting hit in the head. Yeah, very well could be. But, all right, let's go ahead and we'll get off that and we'll break down this week's fights, which actually I didn't even realize this one was here because I didn't go down far enough and you brought it to my attention. But we got Jack Colquet, who's 22-1, and one, fighting in Germany, the WBA World Superweight title against Demetrius Andrade. Um, what's your take on this one? Yeah, well, it's 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 not it's not actually for the super title. It's for their regular. You know, it's it's the uh, WBA light belt. You know, the, the one that really doesn't mean anything to. Well, it anybody, says right but, here WBA World Super Welterweight title fight. No, it's it's a regular title fight. I mean, the, the WBA champion is is not. I mean. It, None of them are really, you know, champions in my opinion. But it's yeah, it's a it's a, it's a regular title. Um, the box Rex says it is, and I'm listening to them because it's, okay, every well, fight should be a title fight. <laughs> yeah, that's what it seems like anymore, right? They're just making them up out of thin air. But yeah, this fight, I think it's a mismatch actually. Um, Kolke is a good German fighter, and you know, a lot of the people in Germany have high hopes for the kid. Um, he had solid amateur credentials. Um, but in terms of what I've seen in the pros, Andrade is going to take this guy, I think, fairly simply. And and I think it's a good thing. I mean, Andrade, he's staying busy. Um, he's getting his name out there. This will put him in line for, you know, a WBA shot at 154 against the super champion, quote-unquote super champion. Uh, but Andrade is a good fighter. I'm happy to see him active. And I think he could be, you know, I want him to be in the mix of 154. I mean, there are a lot of good young fighters down there. And he, he needs to be talked right alongside them. Yeah, and Andrade has definitely fought the better competition. Um, the only thing I'd worry about is if it goes to the decision in Germany. Yeah, a lot of guys have gotten, yeah, gotten a shot Might have there. those Felix Sturm officials there. Felix Sturm, Sven Adke. Yeah, all those guys, you know, we're talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, we got your we got Gamboa against Ren, Rene Alvarado. Um, Gamboa, I think, twenty five and one, seventeen knockouts. His one loss, of course, was to Terrence Crawford. Um, Alvarado's twenty four and seven, sixteen knockouts, which isn't necessarily a really bad record. But when you look at the fact in his last nine fights, he's four and five. I think this is probably a bigger mismatch than the fight, the Colquet fight we just talked about. Oh, yeah, I would say so. I mean, Colke, to his credit, is, is at least in his prime. I mean, he, you know, physically he's, he's, you know, he's there. I mean, with Alvarado, yeah, you, you look at this is just um, this is just Gamboa getting back into the mix of things, maybe. Uh, unfortunately, with Gamboa and what seems like a lot of these Cubans, unfortunately, a lot of really talented Cubans, they just don't seem to – I don't know what it is. They just don't seem to have the drive. I mean, Gamboa looked fantastic at 126. I mean, I, a lot of these, a lot of people are in awe of his ability down there. And then he moves up, and then he stops fighting as much, and then he stops taking on as many names. And it's just, uh, I, I'm not exactly what sure is, what, what's been going on there. But, um, you know, for, for a kind of comeback fight, it's fine. I mean, I, I don't mind it, but I think Alvarado's overmatched. Gambo talented for the guy. I expect a stoppage in the late rounds. All right, we got a Showtime card tomorrow night, headlined by Clarissa Shields. 
U.S. Olympic gold medalist against Sylvia Sabatos. Uh, actually, I think this is the first time that a Showtime card has been headed with the main event by a female boxer. Clarissa Shields is 1-0, and won her pro debut last time out, I think, by decision. Sabatos is 15-8. and This is for the NABF women's middleweight title. Um, you know anything about Sabatos? I don't know a damn thing. Except I, I, I know think she's this. She's like 15 and 8, but probably half those wins are over women that have losing records. My only question here is we know Shields is very talented. You saw that in the Olympics either way. But at the weight she fights at, is she ever going to have any competition there? Uh, it's, it's always so difficult to tell. I mean, women's boxing is just so inconsistent and up and down. I mean, I was I was actually looking at the rankings, you know, because Katie Taylor fought, you know, not long ago. So I was looking at the rankings, and Katie Taylor, for instance, is already rated, uh, what was it, in the top 10, top 15, and she's barely got any any fights at all. Well, yeah, but I'll tell you um, what, I watched Katie Taylor on the undercard. Uh, I think she was right after the Malinaji fight. Katie Taylor can flat out box, though. No, certainly. I mean, you know, there's there's a reason why the Irish love her. I mean, I, I watched her in the amateur. She's she's you know she was a fantastic amateur. My thing though is that okay, we we look at the rankings for instance, and uh, Sabatos. You know, what do we really know about her? Not much. She's from uh, she's from Hungary. You know, she's got some wins over people. Again, it's it's hard to put this into context because. You know, you could see a, a female with a record of 5-0, and oh, and you never know, she might be a major player. I mean, for instance, they only rank 35 women in the entire world in Clarissa Shields' division. You know, so yeah. what, am I, what am I to make of this? I don't know, but I, I can almost guarantee you that it's a showcase fight, that Clarissa, Clarissa Shields is probably going to beat this girl up. Well, I, I just think at her weight, every fight may be a showcase fight. Unless somebody shows up out of the blue that can fight. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I would have to, you know, I'm not too familiar with, with women's boxing. I would have to, you know, maybe there's somebody above her or below her, you know, who's well-known. And maybe she can, you know, try to unify titles, become a two-time, you know, divisional champion. It, it's, it's all hard to assess until I actually look at the names. Um Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do see on in you know at the welterweight division is Cecilia Brackhouse, and she's thirty and zero. I wonder if maybe she would move up and fight Shields, and that would be a damn good fight in terms of women's boxing. I mean, it would certainly be a big sale. The only problem is you know Brack, Brackhouse is um, she's thirty five years old, so she doesn't have much tread on the tire. Yeah, well, I don't know about you, buddy, but I'm 48, and i got plenty of tread left on mine, so we're just going to go <laughs> ahead and transition. Uh, we got a fight card in Belfast tomorrow. We've got Jamie Conlon against Yadder Cardoza. Cardoza's 22-10-1. Conlon's 18-0 with 11 knockouts. And get this, they're fighting for the WBC International Silver Super Flyweight title. Um, that's a mouthful. Uh, I don't think Cardoza, just from looking at his record and a little bit on YouTube, I don't think Cardoza's got much of a shot in this one. No, I don't think so either. I mean, the, the British have a tendency to to bring guys like this over to the U.K. and, and beat them up a little bit. Um, you know, I expect the same thing to happen here. I mean, Cardoza doesn't look anything special. I watched a little bit of film on him before we came on the show, and he just doesn't look like he offers much up for Conlon. Uh, but I'm excited to see Conlon fight, and I think he does pretty well there. Again, this is just a showcase fight. Yeah, and it's really hard to know anything about Conlon because if you look at the guys he's fought, I mean, his last guy he fought was 8-2. and two. The guy before that was 7-9. and nine. He did beat a guy by the name of Anthony Nelson. Um, he knocked him out for the Commonwealth British Empire Super Flyweight Championship. Um, he beat Junior Granados, who's thirteen and three. He beat a guy that's ten and eighteen, fourteen and five. So I don't think there's too much to know about him yet. But no, probably not. But who's making up these titles? This is this is ridiculous. Well, I mean, it gives me it adds like three minutes to the show when you get to talk about four of these titles because the names <laughs> on the titles are so damn long. So yeah, <laughs> what the hell? It gives us something to talk about a little bit longer. Nothing anybody wants to hear. But All right, that brings us to the main event on Saturday night. 
on HBO, we've got David Lemieux against Curtis Stevens. I don't know how anybody that likes to watch a fight would not watch this fight. I mean, this is a, to me, this is a great matchup. No, I, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, everybody should be tuning into this. I mean, part of them, you know, part of the, both these guys have a little recognition because, you know, Golov can beat him up again. But when you look at their fights, they're both come forward aggressors, and they both got big power. I mean, if there's anything the middleweight division has, that has a lot of big punchers. And Lemieux and Stevens are two of the biggest. I like this fight. I mean, I, th- I think it's fantastic. And I think they should be throwing fights on like this a bit more. My thing yeah, there, is, there's even, not too many guys you can find that'll fight like these guys. I mean, to me, this is just a bigger version of Gotti Ward, maybe. I mean, I may be reading too much into this, but both of these guys can crack. Neither one of them are afraid to stand there and do it either. I mean, I think this could be a heck of a fight. Yeah, and no, they I both agree, had man. solid wins over good fighters, so it's not like, you know, they're just knocking out bumps. Yeah, Steve Stevens with his recent trainer change, he's damn good. I mean, uh, who did he fight, Patrick Teixeira? I yeah, believe. he beat Teixeira, he TKO'd him, and then he beat James De La Rosa. Yeah, For the I, WBC I, Continentals, America's middleweight title. Super middleweight, New York City, intercontinental diamond belt. <laughs> yeah, the ninth borough, train station, subway belt. It's just a bronze belt, though, so somebody's got a silver belt. Made out of belt. aluminum cans? Yeah, that's actually the good belt, <laughs> the one out of aluminum cans. Because you, it's worth some money, because you can take those and cash them in for like a couple cents right. each. I think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's actually the intention. But Stevens, he looked good being that Texera. I mean, he looked sharp. I, I was really impressed. I mean, that, that's the best he's looked in years. And Lemieux, I mean, besides the Golovkin beat down, uh, you know, in his loss, you know, years ago, um, Lemieux looked really good, too. I mean, I really liked his performance against Endom. Um, he looked good beating up Glenn Tapia. Um, I, I think this is a good Styles match. And Curtis Stevens always performs better against comfort guys. I mean, he, he always struggles with guys who can circle, you know, guys with strong level movement, strong jabs. But Lemieux is not one of those guys. Lemieux can jab, but he's not, you know, he's not going to move left and right. He's going to come right at you. These guys are going to go throw sharp, quick punches. And I cannot see how this one goes 12 rounds. But if I'm, so who are you, you know, picking somebody, in this? Uh, that's what I'm going to say. If I, you know, somebody's twisting my arm and they're forcing me to pick, I'm going to go with David Lemieux. I think he's the better fighter. I think he scores a minimum stoppage. Yeah, I, I agree with you, actually. I'm going to go with Lemieux also, but I think it's a toss-up fight. Yeah, def- definitely. Good matchmaking there. Kudos. All right, so, Jeremiah, I know we got a little bit of boxing news. What do you want to talk about? Well, I mean, there's been all sorts of stuff in the news lately that um, I would love to get to. Uh, Let me – okay, so besides the rumors that, you know, Tyson Fury is coming out of, um, you know, coming out of retirement, I don't know. Who knows? I don't really care until he actually signs a contract. But there was big news released today. And a lot of people are talking about this. I don't, I don't know if you've caught wind of it yet. But there have, okay, so Schaefer and some other developers are creating, an, or, uh, creating a tournament, a $50 million boxing tournament um, called World Boxing Super Series. And it's going to be a September to May event with two classes of fighters. Um, and event, and the, the winner uh, wins what's called the Muhammad Ali uh, Trophy. And what's going to happen is they're going to, I'm not quite sure what weight class is going to be included. I, I don't know Richard Schaefer is involved in this, um, but it's, um, how, what did it say? I'm trying to remember now, but it's going to be like 14 fighters involved in a tournament, and they just fight each other for this $50 million prize and a trophy. I, I think this is fantastic. All right, so there's no clue on who's fighting or what division yet or anything? Or what no, all the unf- fighters will be there? N- no, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, there. You know, this this is pretty brand new stuff. I mean, I have heard that the, you know, the cruiserweights might be involved. You know, I heard maybe even Tony Bellew, Usyk, maybe Murat Gassiev, Christoph Glavaki, some of them. Um, so, so again, it, that that isn't set in stone yet. But if you have a fifty million dollar boxing prize. I bet you can get some pretty damn good fighters to sign up. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm reading about it right now, actually. Uh, it's like the Super okay. 6 series and This will steroids. feature 16 fighters and a total of 14 main events in each weight class. Eight boxers will battle it out in a bracket-style tournament competition with four quarterfinals. It just makes seven top fights per weight class, total 14 fights in Season 1. So it sounds like it's going to be something they do every year also. Um, an expert panel will invite the world's best boxers, namely the top 15 ranked fighters of the four federations, WBA, WBC, IBF, and WBO. I'm excited, man. Remember, remember what the Super 6 series did for, you know, the, you know, Andre Ward, Kessler, Abraham, Durrells. I mean, Raj. this is, yeah, I mean, this is, this is Super 6 series on steroids. I, I, I think it's great. I mean, if we if they could do this every year, this could be boxing's you know sweet sixteen. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it would be awesome. Um, yeah, I'm still reading about it, so you can keep talking. See if I can come up with something <laughs> new off of it. Oh, yeah, Oscar I, De La Hoya got a DUI too two hours ago. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he, he, as much money as that guy's making, it, it doesn't seem like he you can lay off the uh, the white lady or uh, or. Um, have a booze. Grandpa's uh, old cough medicine. All right. Well, what else do you got there, my? Well, I mean, Andre Berno versus um, Sean Porter is set in stone for, uh, what is it, April 22nd? That's um, not news. That Andre Berno shows up gets his ass whipped by somebody every five months now. Yeah, you know, there's there's unnecessary hype surrounding this fight. I mean, people act like Berno... Honestly, it's it's largely Mayweather fans. If you're a Mayweather fan and you're listening to this, don't kill me. But it's largely you guys that are, you know, making more of Berto than he actually is. I mean, this is a guy who got beat up by Sergio Carrasco, a guy who hasn't been the top ten fighter in, in years. I, I mean, I can't even remember the last top ten fighter that he beat. I mean, and he struggled with a number of guys. I mean, he barely beat Luis Colazo. But Sean Porter is a legitimate top guy. I mean, I, I like, you know, Sean Porter arguably has a case over Kelbrook and Keith Thurman. So I think, like you, you know, that Porter just rolls over him. I mean, Porter's just, Porter's just going to be too physical. He's going to be too quick. He's going to be too strong. Yeah, I, I don't think that's going to be much of a fight. I mean, Berto was a solid fighter at one point, but I still think he was more of an HBO-created fighter. In, absolutely. I mean, you look at his record. You look at who he fought to win his trinket. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's good management. All right. What else you got? All right. So my last bit of news, and I think this is one you've probably heard of as well, is um, Hall of Fame trainer manager, uh, 19 champions, Lou Dova passed away. Dova. You tell you're young. I'll tell you. Lou Dova, <laughs> not Dova. Yeah, Lou I'm was sorry. always entertaining. I, I never could stand Lou, though. I mean, it just, he, his act wore a little thin after a while. But, I mean, he trained a lot of champions, trained a lot of really good fighters. I mean, he was on NBC Sports, it seemed like, every weekend in the 80s, training guys like Alex Ramos, Bobby Chez, all those guys. Um, those I think guys he, trained, he trained Galata. Yeah. Huh? He trained a lot of those guys off that 84 Olympic team, didn't he? Yeah. He trained. What did he train? What did he train for? Now Whitaker. Uh, yeah, I think. Well, I think. Yeah, I think he trained. The start. Whitaker, um, he was Elvis with Taylor. Holyfield at the start, I think. Yeah, uh, he trained. Uh, trained uh, Meldrick Taylor, Mark Breland. Yeah, um, not on that Olympic team, but he trained Vinny Pazienza also. Yeah. Which we've yeah, interviewed Vinny well. before, and Vinny was not a big fan of Liz. But um, <laughs> Johnny Bump, City Bumpus. I mean, you had a bunch of guys in the early 80s that NBC Sports tried to create to be boxing superstars. The guy that stands out, the two that stood out to me were Alex Ramos and Bobby Chez, which Ramos, I think, got knocked out by a guy by the name Ted Sanders, who I think he might even had a losing record at the time, and then you never really heard from Ramos again. Um, but, yeah, Lou Duva trained a lot of champions. Um, and I remember him brawling in the ring after Mayweather Pazienza. I remember him getting drug out of the ring with the Bo Galata farce after the fight ended there. So definitely a colorful character and one that boxing will miss. Yes, most certainly. So any final words for us this week? No, no final words. I mean, I'm just excited that 
Well, I, I do want to mention one thing actually, because I, I think this is this could be really big news, or it could be a bit of a letdown. I mean, on the surface, you know, when you when you take it at face value, it's certainly big news. I mean, the coming back to the Danny Garcia and Keith uh, Thurman thing, um, it peaked at 5.1 million views. Yeah, and it and it apparently did significantly better, 83 percent higher actually than the NBA game that was on ABC on primetime television that Saturday. So that is... Well, that doesn't surprise me. What? <laughs> Why it doesn't surprise me. I mean, as an NBA regular season game, they play 81 of them. But, I mean, this should show people. I mean, I would like for them to get back to where you'd see big boxing events on a Saturday afternoon even. And then the really big ones on Saturday night on TV. And I don't know why they don't do that, because it seems like most of the time when they run boxing on regular TV, I mean, the one thing I would want to know, does it get better ratings than what the UFC does on Fox when they do their Saturday night shows? Well, I don't know. That would be certainly something to look up. Um, Feels like I don't an article off- I could write. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know off the hand. I mean, but, you know, I understand the NBA. They have so many games. But, you know, the NBA is one of the big four sports in America. And, you know, to have boxing do a bit better is certainly good. I'm just hoping, you know, again, going to the, the negative aspect, I hope that people didn't think the fight was not exciting enough to keep watching boxing. I don't think they would have. It's not like it was Larry Holmes against Lucian Rodriguez. Yeah, or Larry Holmes, Tex Cobb. Larry Holmes, Tex Cobb was entertaining, right? <laughs> Yeah, if you're Larry Holmes. It was like a Rocky movie where Rocky Balboa never threw a punch back, but he took everything. Yeah, I, I mean, remember they asked uh, Tex Cut if, if uh, you would do a rematch, and he was like, I don't think Holmes' hands could take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then Howard Cosell, I still think that was his way out. He took it from about the third round on. Because yeah. Tex Cobb was a decent fighter. I mean, he fought some good guys, beat a few good guys. I mean... He fought to a split decision with a prime Michael Dokes. So, I mean, Larry Holmes was yeah. just a legend. Randall Tex Cobb was just a tough guy. Yeah. But, all right, guys, we want to remind you, you can check out thegrillingproof.net for all of our articles, all of our boxing shows, football shows, baseball, pretty much every sport we've got going now. we got a couple more we got to cover, but we'll get that covered also. Uh, make sure you catch out, catch Jeremiah's interview of Dat Win this weekend. Um, also, you can go on tomorrow and catch my interview with former Pittsburgh Steeler legend Rocky Blyer. Um, all you can hear all the shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Google Music, anywhere you find sports podcasts, you'll find the grilling truth. So. For Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.